Well, I want to welcome you again. I am once again preaching to an empty room. It is really crazy, again, to do that. And I think, I didn't do a ton of research on this, but I think this is the first Easter in American history that the church has never met together on Easter. And it's also the first Passover in Israel's history since Egypt where they were locked inside their houses. I mean, it's truly a historic moment. It's truly a historic time. It's crazy. It is really bizarre. But uh, I just want to welcome you to our Resurrection Sunday, Passover Sunday celebration or, or message, I guess is a better way to put it. And let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to anoint this message and anoint this time together. So join me in prayer. And the other thing I'm going to ask you to do is go ahead, and if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to John chapter 6. And I'm going to do a, re, do a, a continuation of last week's message in John chapter 6. So turn to John chapter 6 and go ahead and let's, let's enter into a time of prayer here to prepare our hearts for the word. And so, Lord, we just come before you right now, and we just thank you for this incredible moment in history, Lord, when we celebrate the Passover of Jesus Christ, we celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the greatest event in world history when Jesus was raised from the dead. Lord, we come before you, Lord, and Lord, this truly is a Passover we will never forget for the rest of our lives, Lord, and I just pray that in, as all this commotion is swirling around us, Lord, that you would truly come and anoint this message and you would anoint the, uh, the, our time together, Lord. Let the Spirit of God be poured out upon this message, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, just before, one quick note, because I, I, what happens is I get into the message and I forget about it. One quick note is I'm going to be talking about the new covenant and what a covenant is. And my dad, Ken Kessler, has written a book called Understanding Your Inheritance in Christ. And it has the absolute best explanation for, for covenant that I've ever seen or ever read. We're going to make that, that book available free as an ebook, as a PDF. And if you want that book, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our email list, email.radicalpursuit.net. That's email.radicalpursuit.net. So I want to encourage you to get that. Now, here in John chapter 6, what we see, and I talked about it last week, is last, last week we talked about the four different scenes and how there was a, a crowd that was seeking Jesus, but they were seeking the Lord selfishly. And they were coming to him for the signs and the wonders and the miracles. And they wanted to make Jesus king on their own terms. And then Jesus then sent the disciples ahead of him. And in the middle, as they're crossing the, the lake, the Sea of Galilee, to the other side, as they're crossing over, all of a sudden a storm hits and they're terrified. Jesus comes walking on, to, on the water and they think it's a ghost. And Jesus comes to them in a different form. Then we get onto the other side. The next day, the crowd that was hearing him do the, or hearing him or seeing him do the signs and the wonders crosses over, and Jesus then begins to give them their, his ultimate intention. I came that you might have life. I came as the bread of life. I came so that my life could be in you. And like we talked about last, last week, is that message was really a sword that divided the, the crowd. See, there, most of the crowd wanted Jesus, but they wanted him to fit into their life. And they were okay with the Lord blessing them, and they, were, they loved the signs and the wonders, and they loved the provision. But when the Lord demanded their very life, it brought a sort of division between the crowd and those who truly wanted to follow him. And it actually says that many, that a lot of them were offended at the Lord. They were offended because Jesus demanded their life. Jesus offered to them, really, an invitation into the new covenant. And so what I was doing as I was praying about what do I share on Easter, what do I share on Resurrection Sunday, on Passover, what message would I preach, I thought, 
what better way, what better message to preach than the very message Jesus preached on Passover? In fact, if you look at John chapter 6, here, verse 4, it says that, um, in verse 4, it says, Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. So what you get in John chapter 6 is you get the Lord's Passover message. You know, you've got the, you know, everyone is familiar with the what would Jesus do bracelets, but here is the thing is what would Jesus preach? WWJP, what would Jesus preach? Is what would Jesus preach on Passover? What would Jesus preach? What would he say? And I believe one of the things that he would say would be this message in John chapter 6 that he unpacks and reveals. And so what I want to do in this message is offer you, if you really dig into his sermon, when, and we're talking about scene 3, when Jesus presents to the crowd that has crossed over his ultimate intention, and when Jesus presents to the crowd his ultimate intention, what you see is you see seven steps of how to live by Christ in dwelling life, and you see seven ways that we do that. I'm going to talk about seven. I'm going to talk about four of the steps today, and then in later messages we'll look at the other steps and we'll look at the other ways. But I call it Jesus's guide to living by His indwelling life. And so we want to look at this point by point. The first thing that the Lord says here. Is, or the first point that I believe he makes is if we want to move and make a transition from trying to fit the Lord into our life to him being the life we live by, the first thing is we've got to stop living for the temporal. Jesus said in John 6, 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father, God, has set his seal. So if you think about it, the, the food that perishes, what exactly does that mean? The food that perishes. Well, I think obviously it is really living for our best life now. It's where we're living. The, the motivation of our life is that we would have the most enjoyable, pleasure-filled life we could have, we could possibly have. And so we work hard. And we toil and we put in 60 to 70 hours a week so we can have the best house and, the, and make a lot of money. And we can do all these things to ha live our best life now. And the Lord is addressing this and saying, don't work for the food that perishes. Don't, don't live for the temporary. Don't live for the temporal. Live for eternity. And see, the crowd was living to have their best life. The crowd was living to have their best life now. And Jesus comes right to them and says, don't work for that food. Stop living for the earthly. Stop living for what is so temporary. Stop living. Your, your life is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And I think this crisis really has shown us that, hasn't it? I mean, it really has shown us, okay, our life is a vapor. We are here for a little while, and then we vanish. Then we go, and then we go into eternity. You know, we are truly like the, like the Word of God says. We are like the grass that is here today and gone tomorrow. And yet, sometimes doesn't it take a crisis to hit us, to, to kind of wake us up, to stir us, to jolt us? You know, we get so locked in to our, our work schedules, we get so locked in to our way of life, to business as usual, that we never really stop and consider, okay, what is it we're living for? And so I want to ask you that question, what is it that you truly are living for? Are you working for the food that perishes? Are you living for the food that perishes? Are you living just to have your best life right now? Or is the Lord truly the Lord of your life? Now, that does not mean, of course, we can't enjoy the good things of life, that we can't enjoy good food and sports and movies and vacations and all that thing, all that. But the issue is, are we living for those things? Is that what the, the drive of our heart is? And and so I think this, in this time when the Lord has allowed a divine reset, when the Lord has basically pushed pause, 
is this a great time to reconsider our lives? What really are we living for? I want to encourage you to evaluate your life. Are you truly living for eternity? I'm telling you, I'm, I'm 48, and life goes by super fast. Life goes by so fast. And I thank God, you know, when I was in my 20s, the Lord gave me a realization of how quickly life goes by. In fact, I want to read a scripture here in Psalms 90, 90, where, where actually, let me just quote it just for the sake of time, where it's a prayer of Moses, but he said, teach us to number our days so that we might present to you a heart of wisdom. See, this life is so temporary. Eternity is forever. What are you living for? Are you living for your best life? And I believe the Lord in this current pandemic is just re is revealing to us how fleeting and temporary and shakable our earthly treasures are. See, everything that is not built on the rock of Jesus Christ is shakable material. It is sand. And as the end time pressures increase, that we're going to find out more and more, the only one that is unshakable is Jesus Christ. And the only way we will not be shaken and moved is if Christ possesses us. And so as, the, as everything can be shaken, and everything right now is being shaken, the only thing that is unshakable is Jesus Christ. He is the rock. He is the only one who cannot be moved. And the degree that we have him possessing us, the degree that we have his life in us, filling us, is the degree that we will be unmoved and unshakable. I believe the Lord is urging his people in this, in this crisis, stop trying to fit me into your life. Stop working endless hours that can only offer you temporary pleasure. Stop trying to fit me into your box. Stop serving and obeying me when it's convenient for you. See, if we're going to live if we're going to live by the life of Jesus Christ, the first thing we have to do is we have to realize life is absolutely short a vapor, it's temporary, and we've got to make the shift from living for the temporary to living for the, the eternal, which is point number two. If we want to live by the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, we've got to start living for the eternal. So the crowd was intrigued by what Jesus said, and they said, Lord, tell us, okay, what do we need to do to do the works of God? And I said this last time, is, isn't it just the nature of, of mankind, the nature of humanity to want to do something for God? Don't we want to go out and serve God and do something and build something and, you know, become something for God? And the Lord confronts that straight away and says, he answers their question and he says, this is the work of God. See, they were concerned about the works of God and Jesus was singular, focused upon the work of God. Here in verse 29, he says, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So Jesus takes, goes from the works of God to the work of God. He goes from the many things of God and the toiling to do things for God, to unveiling to them the very work of God, the ultimate intention of God, the eternal purpose of God, and that is his son, Jesus Christ. So we've talked a lot about God's ultimate intention. We've talked a lot about God's eternal purpose. Jesus Christ is God's ultimate intention. The Father will do nothing apart from him. Everything is through him, for him, and unto the Son of God. That is how we have a, a relationship with the Father. It is Jesus is the way. And so the Lord is looking at this crowd of very religious people, and they want to go do the works of God. They want to do the external things of God. They want to be preoccupied with all the different 
things of God, and the Lord says, I want you to be preoccupied with me, a person. And he brings us back to the very foundational issue here is the work of God, the eternal plan of God is found in his son, Jesus Christ. And we see it in, a, in, in Paul's book in the writing to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11, he says, The eternal purpose which he carried out in Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is your destiny. Jesus is what you were created for. He is who you were created for. And see, the Father, I believe in this season of crisis when the world is in panic and we're scurrying about going, what's going to happen? And fear has captured hearts and panic has overtaken so many and we're, we're filled with so many questions. I believe the Lord would say to the church in this time, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. I believe the Father would redirect our hearts away from the things of God to the ultimate one whom God came to rear, gave us his son, Jesus Christ. That we would enter into the very relationship and fellowship that we were created for. See, don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this divine disruption that has been allowed. Don't miss this time to miss the very reason why you were created. You were made for him. You were made for fellowship with him. The work of God is to believe in him. See, it's interesting, isn't it, that in this time right now, when everything has come to a screeching halt, you know, back in the days of Israel, they had the, the, the year of Jubilee, and they would have the year of uh, Sabbath rest, where for a year they would take an, you know, a year off, and they, would, they had the Sabbath every week, but every seven years they would have the Sabbath rest, where they gave the land rest. You know, we're so busy, God had to interrupt it and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you to have a Sabbath. But he's not pointing just to, you know, get a good nap in or watch some more Netflix or something like that. He's pointing you to the ultimate rest of God, which is his son. See, think about this. The work of God is you believe. You believe in him. This is not just mental assent. This is not just being able to quote some Sunday school answers about Jesus Christ. This is about a living relationship with him. Not just believing he's the Messiah, but living a lifestyle where you trust him. See, I believe the only one that can get the world through this crisis and get the world through the crisis that are coming, which are much greater than what we're experiencing now, is Jesus Christ. He is the only way. He is the only solution. And so if we're looking for remedies and tactics and strategies and plans of how to get out of this, I'm telling you, the Lord himself is the only way out of this. He's the only way. He's the only way to get out of what we're, even what's coming, the greater storms that are coming. There's, there's coming much greater storms that are coming. I don't mean to discourage you on Easter. I'm, I'm saying it is imperative now to know him. Daniel talks about the end of the age, and he says, the people who know their God will display strength and take action. This is not just a casual knowing about Jesus of Nazareth. It is not just a casual being able to quote some Bible verses. Daniel's looking at a people who would have an, a deep experiential intimacy with Jesus Christ saying that the people who know God are the ones that are going to show strength at the end of the age. And so God would call us back into the Sabbath rest of, of ceasing from our work. See, the Lord was taking the crowd who wanted to go work for him, the crowd that wanted to go toil for him and do something for him, and the Lord was like, stop, enter into my rest. The Lord, I believe, would even say in this time to the people of God, come unto me, 
You who are heavy burdened and heavy laden, who are tired, who are weary, and I will give you rest. Learn of me, take my yoke upon me, for I'm meek and humble of heart. The Lord would draw a people unto himself in this hour. It's an incredible opportunity. I know, every, you know, I'm the same way. I want my life to get back to normal. I want to go eat at restaurants. Last night, Angie and Anna and I were talking, and we are just like, oh, I am craving Mexican. I am craving barbecue. I'm craving seafood. I mean, you know, I, I could hardly, I got so hungry right before I went to bed thinking about all the food I'm craving, you know, at restaurants. And, you know, I miss sports, and I miss being able to just go to the grocery store without a hazmat suit on. I miss all of that. I want my life to get back to normal, just like you do. All of us do. I mean, some of us are, are really suffering with business. Our business is being affected and all that, and I understand it. It's, it's definitely a challenge for all of us, but God is allowing this opportunity to us to come into a place of rest in Him. Be still and know that I am God. Psalms 46.10. Cease striving, let go, relax, let go of the anxiety, let go of the worry, and come to the Lord who will be your peace. See, sometimes when, when you talk about knowing Jesus and you say, Okay, Jesus is your ultimate intention. Jesus is your ultimate destiny. You know, I've heard the argument often from people, or you hear it, and they're kind of like this, well, okay, I love the Jesus thing, that's cool, but let's move on to something more interesting. Let's move on to something more exciting. You know, this Jesus thing is cool for a while, but let's get into some other more stimulating conversations See, people who make that claim and that, that have that mentality, probably all of us have had that at one point or another, but the point is, people who say that, even if we think that, what it really does is it reveals how little we know him. See, I can tell you, I can tell you with certainty, when John the Apostle saw the resurrected, glorified, ascended Jesus, he wasn't disappointed when he realized, this man is my inheritance. He wasn't disappointed to know this man is my destiny. He was undone. He was ruined by this. The creator of the universe embodied in human flesh, glorified, shining like the sun, realizing that in him is the fullness of the, of the deity in bodily form, realizing that in him is the tr all the wisdom of God, all the wisdom of treasures and earth and, and just wisdom and knowledge are in this man John saw him and beheld him. He beheld the lamb glorified, resurrected, ascended, enthroned. And I assure you, he was undone. He fell to the ground. This was the one who was intimate with Jesus in his earthly life. But when he saw him, he realized, I barely know this man. So if we think Jesus is boring, if we think that Jesus being our destiny is boring, I assure you, I assure you, what that means is you don't know him. What it means is you need, I need, we need a deeper revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul talked about in Galatians that, that the Son of God was revealed in me. See, what we need is we need an inward revelation of him where the Father communicates and reveals to us in our spirit because he communicates spirit to spirit. He needs to unlock and reveal to us this is Jesus Christ. And I'm convinced that many people, many churches, many ministries are presenting another Jesus, and God would want to present the true Jesus as revealed in Scripture. So in this time of, of rest, when everything has been put on pause, God would invite us into his Sabbath rest of believing in Jesus. And some people go, well, I already believed in Jesus. I started believing in him when I was 10. I walked down the altar. That's not what the Lord's talking about here. He's talking about a, 
a day-by-day, moment-by-moment trust in a person, not in a doctrine, not in a, a salvation call we responded to when we were 10. He's talking a moment-by-moment trust in a person. So number two is, is start living for the, in, the eternal. One of the things that, that, just continuing on this, is God has given us a Selah moment. You know, in Psalms, the book of Psalms, 71 times the word Selah is mentioned. That word means to pause, to reflect, to consider See, the Lord is, 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 this is, I mean, this is, I don't know if there's ever been anything quite like this where the entire world has shut down. And the Lord in His sovereignty is giving us a Selah moment where we can pause, we can reflect, and we can consider. What truly are we living for? Who are we living for? And it, it, here's a better question. What is your life source? Because as we're going to see in this message and even later in other teachings, is that the Lord is more interested in, in, in who is the source of your life. Is it your self-life? Is it your soul life? Your, the, the Greek word for it, the suke life. Is it your self-life that is in control as the source of life? We can be extremely religious. We can do a lot of things for God. We can toil and spin by the soul and the power of the soul and the power of self and do a lot of stuff for God that God has nothing whatsoever to do with. God is inviting us into his rest where we would cease striving from the soulish activity that has dominated, the soulish activity that has dominated and affected the church for so many years that we would cease striving from that suitcase, soulish self-life and begin to live by a different life source, the Zoe life of God, the indwelling life of Jesus Christ, that his life would become your life source. Watchman Nee talked about the principle of good and evil, the principle of right and wrong, and, and I think it's really going back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is so many Christians live by the principle of what is good and avoid what is evil. They live by the principle of what is right and what is wrong. See, you can live by those principles of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and still live from the soul, still live from the suke life, and the Lord would invite you into a different way of living. There's two trees in the garden, and I, I believe that so many Christians need to go back and just really get a revelation of the two trees in the garden because really nothing has changed. That living by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, accumulating knowledge, accumulating principles, accumulating wisdom and facts and data, accumulating morals and you know, guidelines and all this stuff of how to live, that we accumulate that, and, and we can do it in any avenue. We can do it for God. We can do it in our own pursuit of success. And then we get that knowledge and then we go live by our own strength and live by our own life independently of the Lord. Or there's a tree of life. The tree of life is not living by right and wrong. The tree of life is not living by knowledge and wisdom. The tree of life is living by a person and his uncreated, indestructible life. See, the Lord would draw us into a different way of living in this season. Stop living from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Stop living from soulish activity, even soulish Christian religious activity, and learn to live by the divine life of Jesus Christ that is inside you if you're born again. The third point, I believe, which kind of goes builds on what I've already just talked about, this is a big change that, I mean, you're going to see in a second. It's a huge shift for us in our thinking. It's a rethinking of what we have always been taught. But here's the third point. Eternal life is someone in us who possesses us, not somewhere we go. 
So I heard someone in the crowd just say, say that again. Okay. Eternal life is someone in us who possesses us. It's not somewhere we go. See, that is a rethinking of what we think eternal life is. We're taught when we're first, you know, get religious, get coming to the Lord. We're taught, okay, eternal life is going to heaven when you die. I'm going to say if you don't have eternal life in you, you'll never go to heaven when you die. I want you to rethink that for a minute. See, eternal life is someone we possess inwardly or someone who possesses us inwardly. Now, it's interesting in John chapter 6 that Jesus used the phrase eternal life 10 times in five verses. Think about that. 10 times in five verses, Jesus used the phrase eternal life. Now, that's, that's pretty significant. Pretty significant. The Lord's really wanting to get onto something here with this and this message in John 6 is the word eternal means. Here's, this is so, this came to me this week. The word eternal means without a beginning or an end. Here's the way I like to think about it without a beginning means his life is uncreated, without an end means his life is indestructible. That's the life Jesus came to put inside of you, to put into your spirit. See, eternal life is a possession. Notice what he says here in John 6, 40. He said, he who believes has eternal life. It's not something you get when you die and go to heaven. It's someone you possess inwardly right now. It's a life that is uncreated. It is a life that is indestructible. It is the very uncreated, indestructible life of Jesus Christ that is now dwelling in your spirit if you're born again. The one who believes has eternal life. It is someone we have in us. It's not somewhere we go. That is a major shift in thinking and what we've been taught for so many years by all the religious teaching we've heard. He goes on to say here in verse 54 that he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the life. And like it says in 1 John 5, 12, the one who has the son has the life. Or you could say the one who has a son has his life. We have eternal life right now inside of us. The question would be, are we living by that life or are we still living by our soulish, selfish life? That's the question for us. The fourth thing that Jesus reveals here in his message in John chapter 6 is that embracing the new covenant is how we receive his indwelling life. Look what he said in John 6, 53. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. Can you imagine? I mean, just think about this for a second. Can you imagine if you're part of this crowd, that we're just going to say it was 10,000 people, 10,000 people at a Jesus conference, excited about the signs and the wonders, ready to make Jesus king, and he stands up, and he says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. They're thinking, okay, this guy is crazy. This guy's insane. He's calling us to cannibalism. He's calling us to eat him and drink his blood? This guy's a fanatic. I mean, you can imagine, if, if you didn't understand what he was saying, you can imagine the response of the crowd would be like, this is crazy. The Lord obviously was not calling us to be cannibals and eat him. Literally, he was, he was pointing to the new covenant. And see, he was pointing to the fact that I am the Passover lamb. The Passover lamb has come. 
I am the new covenant sacrifice. And, and you can go through scripture and see this. Stephen, my brother, sent this to us in a text this week. Genesis 22, you can see it's a lamb for one man, Abraham. In Exodus 12, it's a lamb for a family. In Leviticus 16, it's a lamb for the nation. And finally, in John 6, it's now a lamb for the entire world. How interesting is that? Jesus on Passover is standing before the crowd saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. I am the Passover lamb. I am my body and my blood. My body is the sacrifice of the new covenant. My blood is for the sealing of the new covenant and for the remission of your sins. They didn't understand what he was talking about. And as a result of their lack of understanding, many of them got offended. And a lot of us, a lot of us get offended because we think we, un, we think we know something about the Lord, but our lack of understanding and what he's really trying to do creates offense. I mean, if anyone, if anyone really understood what he was saying, they would have said, this is incredible. The Messiah is the, the sacrifice of the new covenant. Eating of him, partaking of him, accepting him is how I enter into this new life that he offers. See, on Passover, God the Father cut a covenant between God and humanity. Jesus Christ was both the new covenant sacrifice and the new covenant representative. Now, in John 6.53, the tense of the word eat is, a, is really uh, is in the eros tense, but it really is... It's pretty close to the English past tense, meaning that there's a one, there's a one time you eat of him once and you partake of his life. Now, there's other references in, in John 6 we'll get into later where it's in the present active tense where you continually eat of him to abide in him and to re receive of his, to, to live by his life. This is talking about entering the new covenant. Now, like I mentioned at the beginning of this message, in, in Dad's book, Understanding Your Inheritance in Christ, he lists out eight common steps when ancient covenants were enacted. And again, I encourage you to get that, email.radicalpursuit.net. Join our email list, email.radicalpursuit.net, and we'll give you that book. But I, th that book has helped me so much lay a foundation of understanding covenant and what covenant it is, most of the church doesn't even have a clue what covenant it is. But yet the Bible's called the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But one of the things that he talks about in the book is that the fourth step of ancient covenant making was a walk into death. Basically what would happen is the two covenant representatives would have a sacrifice laid out. And you can see it in, Ab in uh, Genesis chapter 15. And the covenant parties would walk around that sacrifice. Some scholars believe they walked in the form of a figure eight. And their basic idea was that they were basically saying, do unto me as has been done to this animal if I break, my, if I break this covenant. See, Jesus took the, the walk unto death for us. He took that ultimate sacrifice. He was the ultimate and is the ultimate sacrifice of the new covenant. But here in John chapter 6, he's inviting us, he's inviting us, he's saying to us, eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's, this is not something casual. This is not a casual, I'm going to just live my life as normal, walk down the church aisle, make a decision when I'm 10 or 15 or 20, a one-time thing and just live my normal life. You probably have not entered into the new covenant, that's the case. The new covenant is a walk unto death. It is a walk unto your death. I don't believe you can enter the new covenant unless you truly lay down your life in absolute, total surrender to Jesus. That's what he is meaning here, eat my flesh, drink my blood. You've got to partake of me to the point where you eat of me and I become the life you live by. 
this, this casual thing, I'm going to try to fit Jesus into my life, that is not Christianity. That is not the new covenant. Anyone who entered into a new covenant laid their entire life down for the sake of this covenant transaction. It was a walk unto death. See, what happens in the Lord's eyes when when we truly are born again, it talks about this in Romans chapter 6, when we're truly born again, it talks about, and, and it says we're united with him in his death and united with him in his resurrection. When we're truly born again. What happens here is that we are, the, the word united in Romans, actually, let's turn to Romans chapter 6. I want to read this. This is a powerful scripture. One of my, I've got so many favorites, but one of my favorite scriptures here. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, you can, you can skim over that pretty quick, but I'm telling you, it's deep. What Paul's saying here is this word united, what it means in the Greek is it means born together with. See, when you're born again, when you have accepted the new covenant sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the Passover lamb, when you've accepted that sacrifice and your spirit is reborn, your spirit is regenerated, what happens is you are born together with Jesus Christ. Here's what that means. is It means Jesus baptizes us into his body. And, then, and now what that means is when he was crucified on the cross, you were crucified with him. When he was crucified, buried in the ground. You were buried with him. When he was raised from the dead, you were raised with him. How incredible is that uniting with him in the cross, spirit to spirit. See, what happens is we become partakers of his life. We become partakers of his divine nature. See, we are born together with Christ. We have a spirit to spirit union with the uncreated God. We have a spirit-to-spirit -spirit union with the one whose life is uncreated and indestructible. You have resurrection life in you when you partake of Jesus as that covenant sacrifice. See, the Lord told the crowd, eat my flesh and drink my blood or else you have no life in you. All you have is human, soulish, suke life, self-life, apart from his sacrifice. But when you eat of him, and you drink of him, and you truly take your own walk unto death, Jesus makes the promise to us, my life will be in you. What an incredible, incredible invitation, offer, we have our spirit and the spirit of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, are now one. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, if anyone turns to the Lord, he is one spirit with him. Wow. You, in your spirit, you cannot get any closer to the Lord than you already are. I know that needs to work out into our heart, into our soul, and outward into our body, but spiritually, you are joined with him. You are born together with him. You have been united in his death, burial, and resurrection. How incredible is that? The same power, the same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead now dwells inside of you and inside of me. That makes now living by the indwelling life of Christ, a possibility. We now have a decision. We have two life sources we can choose from. Suke, soulish life, the self-life, which 99% of the church lives by, or the zoe, uncreated, indestructible life of Jesus Christ. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the mature sons of God. These are the ones who are becoming Christ-like. You cannot become Christ-like just by a trial. Let me say this here. 
Some people think this trial is going to make people holy and righteous. I'm going to say absolutely not. If it doesn't get you into the source of life, all it will do is make you bitter and angry, maybe bankrupt, you know? Trials can accelerate us getting to the person, but until we get to the person, until we partake of him, until we live by his life, trials can only, you know, they, they can only accelerate us. They can only accelerate us. They can only move us to that place. See, don't, don't waste this opportunity you have to come to the Lord to partake of his Zoe uncreated life. See, now that we have his life, now that we possess eternal life, we can now live by that very life. I'm telling you, the, the one thing that has changed my life more than anything else, more than any other revelation, more than any other study, is coming to the realization that Jesus Christ lives in me. It's powerful. It is life-changing. That's why I say it all the time. People are probably like, yeah, you said that last week. I can't get over it. I can't get over this incredibly good news. The uncreated God has taken up habitation in my spirit. Life, Zoe life, is inside of me. I can live by his life. And so as we bring this to a close, as we bring this Passover message to a close, as the Lord speaks to us, during this coronavirus pandemic, I want to encourage you, don't waste this trial. Don't waste this opportunity. Don't, don't keep looking to say, okay, when's my life going to get back to normal? What if you said my new normal has died or my, my old normal has died and I've got a new normal and that new normal is living by a person? That new normal is living by a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. That's what, that's what he's saying right now. Come to me. It's so easy and simple. I want to say it's easy. It's so simple. Come to me. That's what the Lord would say. What, was, what is the Lord saying in this crisis to his church? Come to me. What is the Lord exhorting us to do? Come to me. It's the one thing that can never be taken away from us. Intimacy with him. Amen.